So I'm going to be arguing that um, we should choose serial novel agents. Um, so to begin, um, I'm going to begin with a case. Um, this is a 36-year-old woman with stage 4B classical Hodgkin lymphoma at diagnosis. Um, she originally received ABVD for six cycles and was refractory. Um, at the end of treatment, due to growing disease on her PET scan, she had a retroperitoneal lymph node biopsy that confirmed classical Hodgkin lymphoma. She then went on to receive ICE chemotherapy, to which she had a PET negative response and went on to an autologous stem cell transplant. But unfortunately, about two months after transplant, developed fevers and pruritus uh, and, and underwent a PET scan that showed new liver lesions as well as generalized lymphadenopathy. At that time, she had a repeat biopsy at that time of her liver that confirmed relapsed classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So what do we recommend for this patient? Well, in the past, and I would say even just about five years ago, I would say that what I would recommend was the fastest route I could to get her to an allogeneic stem cell transplant, and that would have been either combination chemotherapy or potentially novel agents. Now, I would say, what's the rush of getting a patient to an allogeneic stem cell transplant? Because we have other great options. So what do we expect with the outcomes with allogeneic stem cell transplant? Um, the data is really all over the place. And um, we have uh, various different retrospective analyses and prospective studies. And with regard to the prospective studies, I feel like that's the cleanest data and the largest prospective study uh, is associated with a four-year progression-free survival of only 18%, and which is, improves a little bit to 26% if you actually look at the patients who actually went on to transplant. Uh, more recently, a prospective study in which uh, at MD Anderson, where they used gemcitabine-based conditioning, the results look a little better, but these patients were enrolled at the time of transplant, so this was a more selected patient population, and in fact, almost all the patients had chemosensitive disease going into transplant. So this is probably the best case scenario of what we would expect um, for a selected group of patients going on to transplant, in which about half of the patients are going to have a prolonged progression-free survival, but of course, a considerable number of those patients will have toxicity associated with the transplant, even though they're in remission. So as I mentioned, so chemosensitivity does predict, has, has appeared to predict outcome for allogeneic stem cell transplant, um, but, but again, the results, the, there's still significant room for improvement for these patients. Uh, more recent retrospective data suggests that haploidentical transplants may be associated with, fair, with improved outcomes. However, we really need more data for this, um, and this is just retrospective data at this point. Um, my colleague, Rob Chen, who you'll hear from shortly, has presented um, very impressive data with regard to brintuximab followed by allogeneic stem cell transplant. And as you can see here, the one-year progression-free survival was actually at about 92%. Now again, this is a retrospective analysis with only 18 patients, and the follow-up is actually very, really quite short with a median follow-up of only 14 months. So I think we really need more follow-up in order to know um, how these patients did um, several years out from transplant. And finally, now in the era of checkpoint inhibitors, we need to consider what is the safety of going to an allogeneic central transplant after receiving a checkpoint inhibitor. And at this point, we really have limited data, but there was a retrospective, retrospective analysis presented at this past ASH that included 19 patients with various different histologies that went on to transplant after receiving anti-PD-1 therapy. And at this point, I would say that the data, we, we really have to consider allogeneic stem cell transplant after PD-1 therapy with a lot of caution. Um, although the one-year overall survival for this group was 78%, there were some early deaths on this, uh, in this group. In particular, there were three patients who had a severe acute GVHD within 14 days of transplant. Um, and so I think we really need to study this more and figure out how to optimize transplant after PD-1 therapy. So what are our options for a patient who relapsed after an autologous stem cell transplant? Um, this is not an exhausted list, but these are the most common treatments that I think of at the top of my head when I'm trying to decide what, to, what, um, what my next choice will be. Um, and among these options, a considerable number of them can be associated with prolonged um, disease control or potentially prolonged remission. I'm going to go through a few of these. And you already heard about the potential for radiation to um, induce a, a, a clinical response. So with regard to brintuximab, Dr. Um, Anne LaCase um, presented this data, and um, 
This is, um, this is data from the pivotal study for brintuximab in which 102 patients were enrolled and all of the patients had failed transplant. And as was mentioned, the overall response rate was quite high with an overall response rate of 76%, about a third of the patients achieving a complete response, and a significant number of the patients, almost every patient, having some degree of clinical benefit on the study. Now, we now have the benefit from uh, Dr. Rob Chen's data with five-year follow-up from this study. And as you can see, there is a plateau to the, to the curves, um, particularly the um, progression-free survival curve, which is seen in the upper right corner. Um, on the bottom corners, we see response with regard, uh, we see outcomes with regard to response to treatment, um, and the black curves represent the patients who had a complete response, and you can see that having a complete response to brintuximab really predicted for more favorable outcomes. When we look a little closer at the patients who remain in remission on, uh, following the study, there are 15 patients who remain in remission um, five years out from the study. Now remember, this was only one year of treatment, so these patients are not on therapy. Um, so of those 15 patients, there were six patients who went on to an allogeneic stem cell transplant, so we potentially could attribute their long-term remission to the allogeneic stem cell transplant. But the other nine of the patients only received brintuximab, achieved a complete response, and remained in remission five years out from the study. So did it appear that an allogeneic stem cell transplant have an impact for the patients who achieved a complete response to brintuximab? Um, of the 34 patients who had a complete response to brintuximab, only six of them went on to allogeneic stem cell allogeneic stem cell transplant, and it's, it's hard to compare the groups because so few patients went on to transplant, but there really was no difference in overall survival or event-free survival when you look at these two groups. And it was very nicely summarized by Dr. Chen that uh, now for patients who achieve a complete response to brintuximab, the notion that reduced intensity conditioning allogeneic stem cell transplant is the only option for long-term disease control is now challenged. So what about, what other options do we have for a patient who then relapses after brintuximab? Now, as you already heard, we have um, great data, or very exciting data with checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and it turns out that Hodgkin lymphoma was a great candidate to evaluate checkpoint inhibitors due to its extensive immune infiltrate and the almost universal expression of PDL1 and PDL2. Um, so this is a summary of the data for both nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Um, the phase one data for pembrolizumab in relapse and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma is shown here, and that included a study with 31 patients with the overall response rate of about 65%. Um, for nivolumab, um, this is the phase two data that is shown that um, in enrolled patients who had failed both autologous stem cell transplant as well as brintuximab, um, and the study included 80 patients, and similar overall response rate is seen with 66% uh, of the patients having an overall response. As you can see from the waterfall plots, almost every patient has some degree of clinical benefit. And at this point, although the study is still ongoing and patients remain on treatment on the study, um, of the 53 patients who responded to nivolumab on the phase two study, the majority of the patients uh, remain on treatment, uh, about two-thirds of them remain on treatment with ongoing responses, and some of those responses you can see are going beyond a year. Um, I can personally tell you that I'm taking care of one of those patients who's certainly pretty far out from a year. Um, as far as other options, um, besides brintuximab and checkpoint inhibition, um, everolimus does represent an option as well, and there are some, um, the res overall response rate to everolimus is about 42%, and this is another drug that potentially can be associated with prolonged um, disease control for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. And likewise, lenalidomide is, a, I consider, to be another option that can potentially provide patients with, di with prolonged disease control. Um, the overall response to this agent was only 19%, but a considerable number of patients had um, prolonged disease control. And as you can see from the, um, the plot on the right, um, at the bottom, there about a third of the patients had uh, disease control um, approaching about a year or more. So what happened to my patient? Um, so this was a patient, um, just in review, with primary refractory classical Hodgkin lymphoma who had relapsed after an autologous stem cell transplant. I initially did give her brintuximab, and unfortunately she only had a mixed response to treatment. 
And then she subsequently enrolled on the clinical trial with nivolumab and achieved a, a partial response and currently remains on treatment um, in, with ongoing partial response. Um, just so she, um, upon starting nivolumab, she had resolution of all of her disease-related symptoms. Um, she's currently tolerating treatment well with the occasional rash, which is well tolerate, well managed with topical steroids. And she has a, basically a normal life, except for the fact that she sees me every two weeks to get treatment. What, what are my plans for her at the time of, of progression? Well. Um, depending upon what the clinical trials are available, I would consider a clinical trial. I might consider everolimus or lenalidomide. I might consider combination chemotherapy or single agent chemotherapy with the potential for an allogeneic stem cell transplant, but that really depends upon what the data available is at that time. And we may, it may be that we have several years before we have to figure that out. Um, and so at this point, I'm not rushing to get her to an allogeneic stem cell transplant. I'd like to see if we can improve the, the efficacy as well as the toxicity related with transplant. So in conclusion, in the post-transplant setting, brentuximab as well as nivolumab can lead to long-term disease control and a favorable quality of life for our patients. Um, other options include lenalidomide as well as everolimus. And um, radiation, which I didn't really touch upon, is also an option for patients who have localized relapse and may also be associated with some long-term disease control. And then finally, whoops. <laughs> My last line's gone. <laughs> For allogeneic stem cell transplant, I would say that what is the rush? At this point, I think that we need more data and more studies to try to optimize the safety of allogeneic stem cell transplant. And it may be that with the new novel, the novel agents we have available now and hopefully more to come, we may be able to eliminate the need for allogeneic stem cell transplant altogether. Thanks so much.